Today, we welcome Dr. Robert Davis to Skeptico. Bob is an internationally recognized expert in the field of sensory neuroscience. I was just browsing his curriculum vita before we talked here and <laughs> way beyond my comprehension, but I have to take it for what it's worth. He's a guy who's had a stellar academic career, all the usual stuff, articles in scholarly paper, NIH grants, call to conferences to speak, all this stuff. And then, like we like to say on Skeptico, you know, the universe knocked, more or less. Bob and his wife had a rather lengthy UFO sighting a few years back that led to his first book, The UFO Phenomenon. Then he had a rather remarkable shared near-death experience, or shared death experience, I should say, if you know what that is, leading to his second book, Life After Death. And to top it all off, he has this rather remarkable Kundalini experience, a peak experience that more or less leads to his third book and one that we're going to talk a lot about today, Unseen Forces, the Integration of Science, Reality, and You. Bob, awesome, awesome work. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Alex, it's, it's really a pleasure to be with you. I've been listening to you for quite some time. Well, great. You know, you were telling me that a little bit beforehand, and that's always good to hear, especially because I want to try something different here. I'm just started trying it out lately, but I really like the way that it goes because it launches us into these level three kind of discussions. And in the email exchange, we had back and forth. And because you're a listener to the show, you know what I mean when I say level three. We don't have to go over the basics. We don't have to try and painstakingly deal with all the stupid, skeptical nonsense, and we can get to some of the real issues that are important to the people like you and I who are deeply into trying to figure this stuff out. So, are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Skeptico Jeopardy. It's for those who are listening along, here are my categories for you. Mind equals brain, biofield, NDEs versus abductions, different world, and we'll explain what that means, but that's one of the key ideas from the book. Time and space, peak experience, obviously we have to get there. Xanax, I got an interesting spin on how much we should rely on the medical field to save us from the spiritual emergencies, there are no doubt there. Kundalini, we've got to talk about that. And of course, I always have God on the list because God seems to be left out of these discussions all too often. So, Dr. Robert Davis, please pick your category. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay with Bob, but, the, but we'll, we'll start with, I guess, the peak experience. I think that's the overarching issue uh, in, in a sense right here. So let's go with that one. <laughs> okay, peak experience. And I guess that leads to a really easy question for me. How are you defining peak experience? Well, it's... Um, it, it is debatable. Um, uh, Stace uh, talked about it quite a while ago. Uh, it's, it's a broad range of spiritual, uh, mystical, extraordinary experiences, uh, uh, perceived generally in terms of an uh, ineffable type of description of, of reality. They have people report having an altered sense of time and space, uh, possibly even um, uh, interacting with non-human entities. So that's a distinct possibility. But they sense this interconnectedness, a, a common sense of oneness with the cosmos, as they say. Do you uh, worry? Here's a, yeah. a direct question right out. Do you worry that we're lumping too many things together when we talk about peak experience? We may very well. Uh, and that's part of the problem. Weeding, weeding things out, trying to more specifically define with precise criteria what we are talking about. But, and I have lumped uh, the NDEs, OBEs, uh, you, even the UAPs, uh, meditation, psychoactive uh, reactions. That falls under the heading. Those are all trigger-like experiences of this overarching peak experience, this, this extraordinary event that seems to transform people in, in remarkable, often similar, generally positive ways in terms of psycho-spiritual changes. Um, and, and the question here is why? Why do these different types of trigger events share similarities, unique differences, no doubt. But why do they have such a remarkable effect on people from that day forward? 
Uh, and that is the that is the critical question here. And why doesn't the medical community, psychiatric community in particular, like give more emphasis, more attention to the millions of individuals who are having uh, difficulty integrating this remarkable, let's call it peak experience, let's call it a spiritual uh, awakening, uh, a transcendent, uh, it, whatever you want to call it. It goes by many different names. Uh, but nevertheless, people are questioning what happened to them? Why me? Uh, did I actually interact with another reality? Am I going insane? Uh, they're, they're hesitant to seek professional help for fear of, of being uh, regarded as, as psychotic in nature. Because the last thing you want to hear is that you are psychotic. When you question your sanity, uh, that can put you over the edge, and it does. Uh, many people don't, uh, are obviously don't want to go there. So they, they're in silence or confined in just with one person. And people know that they're different. They're having a spiritual emergency. I had a spiritual emergency. We all. That's why I brought that, you know, I just popped that up on the screen. Uh, Let's talk about that because that's pretty amazing. And it takes us in a bunch of different directions that I think are interesting. First of all, we want to tell people what a Kundalini experience is. You know, it's been documented in the uh, yoga literature for a long time. Uh, Culturally, we've kind of maybe not always used it correctly in terms of the definition of what it is in the West, but it still basically comes through. And it's a physical, biological kind of thing, a lot of times the way people talk about it. And then there's this integration problem that you're talking about. Sometimes people have these Kundalini awakening kind of experiences, these all-knowing peak experiences, wild energy that runs through the body kind of experience. And sometimes that comes after a very rigorous set of exercises, meditations over a period of years, guided by an experienced guru type who's going to lead you there. But other times, as you're going to, I think, tell us about, it comes in a more spontaneous, out of control way, out of the blue sometimes. We've had some people on the show who've talked about exactly that, and it can be very unsettling when it comes that way. So I've kind of teed it up a little bit, but fill out the missing pieces and tell us about your Kundalini experience. Well, you know, uh, well said, Alex. A Kundalini experience, it's just simply another type of trigger event for an overarching peak experience. They're very similar. Uh, In my case, it did emerge spontaneously, but let me uh, give a little backdrop to this quickly. Um, I gave a talk in Australia. Following the talk, I was invited to participate in a little party uh, in a hotel room, one of the women there, uh, a physician, uh, actually said, let's do some medical healing. Uh, so uh, people sat around, about five, six of us, and she started to talk. She started to, to talk about erasing engrams, removing negative energy, um, energies, genetic uh, dispositions, all of this type of information that, that kind of was focused on uh, cleaning the person out. Uh, removing all those, the negative so-called karma. And she was very descriptive about it. Nevertheless, I started coughing, couldn't stop for 20 minutes. I started having involuntary movements of my, of my shoulders, my head. Uh, and I was conscious, I was fully aware that I was literally out of control. I could not and have not ever experienced that. I could not control myself. And at the same time, while I'm more than curious about what's going on with my body, I felt wonderful. I felt that surge of energy that you talked about, uh, uh, kind of like a foundation in a way of a typical kundalini. Uh, what do people uh, talk about? Maybe maybe something having to do with a chakra and a release of energy from the base of the spine. Uh, you know, maybe maybe that's that's all that, that it is. But but it's obviously not clear to the medical community what is actually going on, other than that it was like a dual awareness. I was here in the moment, but but I couldn't control my body, although I was very aware of what was going on, and I loved it. I, it was a, a, a very positive energy. Uh, here again, it's impossible to fully explain uh, to another person unless they have it. But I was, for a period of time, transformed by that. It was a, extraordinarily positive in many ways, but it did have and that spiritual emergency attached to it. Numerous obvious questions are going to be asked by anyone. Uh, but I felt that interconnectedness. How does it manifest? 
again, ineffable. I can't explain it. I felt more at one with reality to the point where I started to hug trees every time I walked in the park. I felt that kind of closeness. Uh, it's a life How form. long did it last? Uh, several months. I was very anxious. Try to read everything about the Kundalini experience. Eventually found uh, Dr. Groff's book on spiritual emergency. Uh, anybody who is experiencing something like that, whatever event, and people have it for, again, a variety of trigger experiences, NDEs, OBEs, psychoactive, etc. in UAP. The thing is, um, that book is a, a critical resource, and it does provide sufficient perspective to give you a better sense of what's going on and possibly what to do. Now, you need that kind of comfort. You need that so, kind so of... So let's, let's back yeah, up and make yeah, sure everyone yeah. knows who Stan Groff is. Of course, you and I do, but absolute pioneer in these fields and has explored these extended states from a number of different kind of venues or paths in, as you were kind of talking about. So started out with psychedelics, but also just went to meditation, rhythmic kind of drumming and all this kind of stuff, which then relates to what we see in cultures throughout time that are isolated from our modern society. They still have this way. And now we understand that as a way of accessing these peak experiences, these altered states, and that starts to connect. So then the other thing Stan Groff starts to do is start documenting what it's like to be in these states, how long these states last. As you were alluding to, and maybe you want to speak more of, they can be extremely uncomfortable and also just unsettling in a number of ways. I mean, it, they lead to all sorts of personal problems. You know, the people that are closest to you may not be able to relate to you for that six months or sometimes for a year that people are kind of off and doing things. So there's all those things we want to pull apart and maybe I'll stop and do that. But then what I really want to get to is beginning to start to understand or take stabs at what we think that's saying about this larger reality and whether it's a different world or whether it's looking at the world differently, as you like to put it. But fill in any gaps I left about Stan Groff's important work and then the general lay of the land for these Kundalini experiences. And go ahead, <laughs> stop there. Yeah, uh, we need more support from the psychological community, uh, and they need to be aware of the unique types of psychological problems these individuals are having, trying to wrestle with what happened to them. The fact that mainstream science, of course, doesn't recognize uh, the things that we're talking about as being true reality in the sense of an NDE, a Kundalini, etc. They Maybe that lack of acknowledgement, understanding has led to a, a paltry, an inadequate, inferior management system on the part of the medical community, psychiatric in particular, and psychological, to manage people, to help them with the unique experiences. There are some who do that, but they're few and far between. And uh, look, millions of people have these experiences every year. We know 200,000 people in the United States alone have an NDE. Uh, do you think they were the same person having their morning coffee and a bagel the day before? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, coming off of something like that is going to more than rock your world and transform you in, in many ways. Um, and that is a, a critical question among many others. Why are these individuals, again, transformed? But I always wonder and I always worry if we're not asking the wrong question there. So let me review some of the data that you just glossed over. You go talk to an NDE researcher like PMH Atwater, who's done an awesome job of exploring exactly that topic that is under reported, if you will, because not a lot of folks want to talk about the fact that you're going to have this NDE, you're going to meet God, you're going to be transformed, and then you're going to come back and you're going to be suicidal and get a divorce. You know, no one wants, no one wants that to start. And it's not like that always right. happens, but right. Right. you know, it doesn't solve all the problems. And then interestingly enough, you know, you are super well versed in the UFO contact ET contact experience stuff. And you're well tied into the free organization and know the data set as well as know the stuff around that. And so there the story is the same, right, Bob? These people, even if they have spiritually transformative experiences as part of their contact experiences, or if they don't, if they have more traumatic, you know, experiences, same thing, they come back, you know, divorce rate goes way up, feelings of isolation goes way up, you know, 
all these things are kind of the hidden message. And then I go talk to a guy I really appreciate and like his work is Dr. Jeffrey Martin, a guy who studied the awakening enlightenment experience scientifically, Harvard trained social scientist, right up the alley of what we're talking about here. So go talk to Christian mystics as well as Buddhist Zen, the best practitioners, you go to a community and you say, okay, who's really got the goods? Who's really enlightened? And then you go talk to those people and you find out their experience, their phenomenology, what that's all about. And you go study that and, you know, you look the best you can at what it means to become awakened or enlightened. Again, same thing. Yes, it's a great transformation. Wouldn't change it for anything in the world. Also leads to increased divorce, higher rates of, you know, major upheaval in your interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. So here we're talking about people who are just going through a different kind of awakening, but we're saying the same thing. So let's tackle that for a minute, particularly with, uh, well, I, I understand what you're saying about turning on the medical community to this. The flip side is, is that really a viable path? because they are so ingrained with the thinking. And that was really the point of what I had up on the screen of the Xanax thing. You know, I mean, this is a Xanax world where Xanax is like the most popular party drug at college, right? And kids are doing Xanny all the time, right? And we have a pharmaceutical industrial complex that cranks that stuff out. They know they're selling a hundred times more Xanax than anyone in the world would need unless they're using for recreational purposes and they don't care. And the whole system is built around that model. And I don't want to get super conspiratorial other than to say, is that really where we want to turn for help? And I guess we could argue that where else are we going to go because people need help and they're going to go see their doctor. But boy, it's just a tough road. Uh, so yeah, have- yeah. It's, it's, it's so much. There's so much there. It's that, that's one critical aspect to this whole phenomena. We can't, don't even understand the essence of the different types of phenomena we are addressing, let alone consciousness, in order to try to make sense of what is reality. Are people actually having these experiencing and, and is consciousness is something different than the brain? It all ties into into these bigger issues that we all bring to the table on a daily basis. Uh, is this all there is, what my senses tell me? And if I pierce the veil, if I have an extraordinary experience, if I have an altered state of consciousness that is so distinctly different, joyous, positive, as so I feel, um, right then, however, do I have so many conflicts in my my life thereafter, like like you mentioned, a high divorce rate, that is quite true. Three quarters of those that have NDE have a divorce within the first five, five or ten years after the experience. It does result in interpersonal relationship problems. So here again, big deal. If they say they're spiritually awakened, you know, why all the crises at ho- uh, on the home front? Uh, there is a, a disparity here. Maybe, and the medical community regards these individuals for the most part as having a form of psychosis, another issue. So not only do we need to manage it, we have to understand what we are managing their symptoms that were facilitated by some type of um, perceptual experiential interaction with something, which includes all of the things that we're talking about, which includes the, the, the silvery disc in the sky and the grays and the reptilians coming into people's rooms and people have NDEs and they say they're interacting with deceased relatives and only deceased relatives or a supreme being. Or people are saying, I knew my friend had died even though I didn't know he or she was sick more common than twins, but nevertheless, the shared death experience that I had, this overwhelming sense of knowingness that that someone had died, ESP, which in my mind is real, I don't want to hear otherwise, subtle effects, very subtle, but it is real. And then the psychoactive drugs, the DMT, psilocybin. Look, they just did an online survey at John Hopkins University, over 3,000 individuals, a quarter of them were atheists. After ingesting psilocybin, about half of them became believers in some supreme being. The, the point is, it has to be a profound event to alter one's religious profile, in a sense, uh, spirituality to that magnitude. Uh, and, and, you know, let me just put an exclamation point on that. I love that you brought that up because I heard that in one of your interviews and I didn't have it in the notes. It's a phenomenal point because uh, I, I would just relate it to 
like uh, Dr. Jeffrey Martin's finding on the awakening enlightenment thing. In case people don't know, the point you just made is like rock solid uh, in terms of evidential in the psychology community. People do not change those beliefs. The number of people who just don't have any kind of peak experience and yet have fundamentally change their beliefs in that way is really, really, really low. So the fact that it would be that high is super significant and is a major pointer that something is going on along the lines of what you're talking about. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Right. Thank you. And, and I'm glad you're aware of that, uh, as many of your, your listeners are. Uh, then that's only the effects of psilocybin. Similar outcomes occur from the NDEs, as we mentioned, uh, uh, among others. So the, why? What does trigger it? Is it obviously just a brain event, uh, or is it an aspect of you, the soul, I? It, you can't help but not consider that possibility. And I don't have an answer. I don't know if people are actually interacting with another reality, another dimension, that is in our time and space with a different fr phase and are interacting with beings. But, we, but again, we have millions of stories. This is all anecdotal primarily. Uh, it doesn't match with current scientific laws, as we all know. Uh, we have to be careful who we talk to, to about this, right? It doesn't get enough attention in terms of research on the part of the scientific community. We're grasping at straws. Very few uh, studies are done in this arena. One critical study that I just became familiar with, uh, Alex, was, was uh, looking at the semantic content of individuals who have an NDE and contrasting with those who had a psychoactive effect from DMT, dimethyltryptamine, ayahuasca. The similarities were astonishing, uh, pointing to the fact that obviously these two kinds of PE triggers are similar in terms of the experiential perspective. Hold on, Bob, that's fascinating, and I'd like to hear more about that. Do you kind of remember off the top of your head the, the methodology, how they did the, the language kind of parsing? You were obviously pretty impressed by it and how that kind of played out. I'd love to hear more about that. If you uh, I, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with it. Uh, I don't have all the details at hand. Uh, it, look, Alex, invite me back. That alone, among a few other studies, is another show, I'll tell you the truth. But that study uh, was comparable to uh, only a few other studies, like meditators who achieve that non-dual state of awareness their, again, semantic content of the ex essence of the experience was comparable to those who have NDEs, comparable to those who have the DMT experience. The point is there is overlap. And even those with the UAP experience, they, they seem to have some altered state of consciousness that parallels to some extent. Unique differences, no doubt, among all of these, but there are sufficient similarities in terms of altered state of consciousness and transformative aspects of behavior going forward that can't be ignored. Point is, is it a brain event? Somebody accessing, hijacking our consciousness? Does it prove that that we are interacting with some alternative reality? And the profound magnitude of that event, emotional and physical and non-physical, is beyond belief to the point where it does have a transformative effect. It seems to result in that ego dissolution, an, an inability in an in individual's ability to di distinguish internal from external reality. So they have an absence of time and space, in other words. They have ineffable emotion, joy and peace, they feel, love, unconditional. We, we know it, we've heard it before. There are more critical questions at hand that must be asked. Uh, you know, what, what is true reality? And if you ask the materialist mindset now, we know that it's what, what you see is what you get. It's sensory information, photons bouncing off physical objects. After coming here from 14 billion years ago when the, well, from the Big Bang, okay, it simulates my retina to convert it to electromagnetic energy. I perceive it. It's real. It's all or none. Yes or no. That's reality. That's true reality. Or... How about millions of people who are saying similar things, saying that they are interacting with the disease, saying that they experience the beauty uh, that can't be put into words, unconditional love that cannot be expressed to capture the moment. Uh, they don't even want to return to their body in the, in the E case. Well, what about the, all the other aspects, uh, details of their perceptual experience when they have these events in their lives that change them, the point is this, is that another aspect of reality? Should that be regarded, in other words, by uh, materialists as another reality? Well, you can make a case for realism, 
a paradigm shift to now start to consider the subjective experience a heck of a lot more than it is on the part of the scientific community. It has to be quantified. It has to follow the scientific method. It has to be statistically analyzed. Well, maybe not. Maybe not everything should be. Maybe this phenomenon, this altered state of consciousness, it's an extraordinary thing. We don't understand a bit of it. I can sit here and tell you some neurological stuff that goes on in the brain. You know, the default mode network is now operational and that may sound sure as a foundation to all of this. I don't know. It's a good guess at best. You know, you said something, uh, either I read it in your latest book, Unseen Forces, or I heard it on one of the excellent interviews you've done. You've done some great interviews and people can check those out and maybe we'll provide some links to uh, the other interviews in the notes because we are kind of jumping in the middle of things here. But you said peak experiences relate to needing an entity, right? So I wanted to explore that because I thought that was kind of a cool idea is that these people invariably are talking about having an experience with an entity. And I love where that takes us because it takes us in a couple different ways. You know, we all understand the abduction thing. Oh, the entity is a gray on a ship. But in the NDE, the entity is different. Sometimes it's just a spirit light. Sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's Jesus. And Jesus tells you to come up and feel his hand where he was nailed to the cross kind of thing. So, but then we can also, again, jump over to the shamanic experience or the DMT experience. And there's another entity. But yours was the first case. And it made me think differently of peak experiences equals meeting an entity. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> I, like, I like that. A plus B equals C. Then a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you, know, you, could, you know, you can make a case not only for entities being a one similarity among this, sure, the grays with the UAP, the deceased relatives in the NDE, uh, and elementals, little putions for the psychedelics. There is this interaction. Is it based on wishful thinking? Is it also, does it come from the unconscious in terms of Oh, what forget it. Let's get next? way past yeah. that. Let's yeah. get way past that. Because yeah. here is part two of that question that's really interesting to me because I'm going to definitely drive you past that stuff. <laughs> and that is, are we at a point where we can start making some educated guesses of the structure and the architecture that those entities are in. I mean, you know, here's the question I always kind of cut to the chase. Does E.T. have an NDE? Who does E.T. pray to? You know, and, and I'd say that just to be provocative. You know, that wasn't a question I would really ask you, Bob, but, you know, it just kind of sets people spinning. Could we say at this point that, you know, oh, the reptilians are bad. So on this uh, spiritual development scale, if we put it at one to 10, reptilians are, uh, they can be anywhere from a five to an eight or a two to an eight. Human beings can be like a three to a nine, you know, and that up at the top is the Godhead kind of thing. I mean, this is eventually, I think, where people are wanting to go in terms of mapping the extended realm and mapping the entities that are in that realm and how close are we to start being able to, to say those kind of things? They do add a little bit more meaning to this. You know, if we had the answer to that question, uh, and many people consider that they do, and I, all I have to say is that their egoism is showing when they do say with fierce determination that they do. As far as I'm concerned, we, no one knows the answer. I doubt we're even close to the answer. We probably aren't even asking the right questions. And if we were given the answer, we couldn't even understand it. Uh, so it's almost like consciousness talking about consciousness and trying to define consciousness with your consciousness. I mean, that's the greatest paradox of all. Uh, we're trying to define this issue of non-human entities in all their various shapes, sizes, and bizarre types of interactions that people have reported being been reported for eons. That the, the, the dwarfs and the elves of folklore in the Bible are now possibly the greatest reptilians of, of today. Uh, you, you can't ignore the archetype structure, as Young would refer to it as possibly, uh, as, and, and the evolution of these entities over time that's consistent with this what, psychocultural, sociological norms, anthropological norms. There's papers written on that. I, I don't have the answer. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't have the answer to anything here. 
let me say that up front. I'm, I'm trying to synthesize and integrate a massive, overwhelming amount of information as best as I possibly can. It may be completely off base, and it just brings me to the peak experience as a, as a foundation. And you have all these little spokes going off, and then more spoke books. But I think that peak experience, you also state of consciousness, and the various things that give rise to all the states of consciousness, and the associated semantic perceptual content of the experience, the interactions of beings, as they say, in all its shapes and sizes, etc. It boggles the mind how many <laughs> varying types of you know, experiences we're talking about here, but they share common themes, and there's a long list of themes. And why the medical, scientific, uh, and non-scientific community doesn't allocate much more attention to, to this critical issue is it's something that has troubled me but I always wrestle not only with the issues that I've had that led to writing these three books the Kundalini experience I had that led to the unseen forces recently I, I question it daily I question reality daily not from a psychotic perspective <laughs> at least I hope not <laughs> you know no I totally know what you mean right, right. <laughs> yeah and we all we're all truth seekers you, you are obviously you know look at you and you're listening we're all truth seekers maybe innate innate spirituality we, you know, this uh, probably uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance can make a case for how we are uh, spiritual in nature, like our ancestors were. They had to be much more so, I think, to try to provide some comfort uh, in terms of a crazy chaotic world of lightning strikes and thunder that had no meaning explanation. So they were always looking to gods. I think we got some of that genetic stuff and, and we're, we're still asking questions in an appropriate way. Many going into religion, many going into nothing, atheism, many going into maybe the genre that we address. And, and you can make a case for it being a, a religion in and of itself, but it's turned into a circus. It's turned into a business. And that's okay. That's okay. It draws specific subsets of people. That's okay. Maybe that, however, is another reality that we're missing the boat on that should coexist be given to more consideration by mainstream science. I agree. I just want to emphasize that last point in terms of that's okay, because I, I like the way you laid that out, because it is true, you know, and people get into, for example, the UFO community, and then people freak out. You go tell your wife, you go tell your friend, and they're like, oh my God, you know, tinfoil hat and stuff like that. And that still exists, you know, that's still hard to do. And yet, as you and I know, there's a lot of really smart thinkers in the UFO community, and there are some people who are seeking it for other reasons. And like you said, that's okay. You know, all these different tribes are okay, and we can try and bring the tribes together in different ways, and we probably should, but it's natural given how they've been ostracized and systematically made to feel alone, afraid, isolated, disinformation, mis of course that's how it's going to be. So that's a great point. I want to try something else out. I'm really interested in bouncing this idea off of you because you keep going in a slightly different direction and you may be right. So I'm not saying this in terms of saying, I know this is the answer or I'm not even sure how I lean, but I guess I've got to put it out there before I say. When I look at the yogis, when I, and I say yogi in the general term, it could be a Christian mystic, it could be a Zen, Buddhist, whatever. When I look at those guys, they seem to be saying something different about these extended realms than other people are saying. They say things like, capture the castle. Don't worry about the entities that you'll experience along the way, the witches and the demons and all that. Just let all that go. Go deeper, go deeper. Capture the castle, saying there's something beyond all that, and this is a middle ground. You go talk to Yogananda, you know, the famous yogi who used to live right up the road from me. Find the river of love and jump in and drown yourself. So they're saying that all this stuff that we're talking about is still in the middle. You know what I mean? It's still this middle ground and there's something else beyond it. And I see threads of that in the NDE as well. I see some people who go to the NDE space and they're in the middle and that's all they can handle. They're in the middle. Hey, you didn't do so good. Here's the fire. If you let God, you're going to wind up here. But then there's other people who just transcend that and go way, way further. So I don't know if that's really a valid map or not. But what concerns me and what I think you and I, Bob, could have an interesting talk about is if there's some truth to that map, that paints this whole thing we're talking about quite differently. 
Do you have any thoughts? Do you, you Alex, know what I mean, right? Yeah, I know. I know to me, it's a profound question. Boy, it requires a heck of a lot more time to to explain. And it could be how we are evolving in terms of human potential with the yogis, the people you refer to. Uh, they seem to have a better grasp, a handle uh, on that expanded consciousness, on spiritual awakening, uh, on interacting with these beings, um, you know, going beyond it, you know, capturing the castle, f- finding the river, et cetera, et cetera, of love. Um, we have it today, you know, from some event in NDE and OBE, the Kundalini, and it's triggered just like that. It's an all or none spontaneous event, which is hard, impossible to study, obviously, for that reason alone, in part. Um, but these individuals have been practicing some form of yoga, of, of mind-body stuff for, what, many years, obviously decades. They get good at it. We can learn from them, possibly. They are demonstrating to us an aspect of human potential that anybody can have on the right cultivating kind of conditions. Instead of trying to remember the the you know the year America was discovered, let's <laughs> let's you know let's focus a little bit more on, on really maybe uh, enhancing our potential abilities. Uh, and, and maybe the brain is impeding these abilities. You know, maybe maybe it's now in full blown, and we're kind of hostage to it. You can make a case for that, uh, and it was kind of symbiotic with the brain, but. And and they, they win. You know, I'm in my 60s. I can't do very much of the brain now. Maybe I could have, you know, we all could have as children. I think I, I see where you're going. And there's many ways to address that. And that, that was expressed beautifully, Alex. Uh, but that is what we need to look at. You, you know, the little nuance within the phenomena. We have these people, but we have these people. And we can learn from it. Yes, I think so. You know, Bob, when I was first coming across your story, which is just remarkable, and it has, you know, elements of it that you hear over and over again. And as I introduced it, I said, you know, the universe knocked. Have you given any thought to that from this spiritual path, soul path kind of thing? Do you have any inkling as to why you were led in this way, and in particular in this order, you know, the UFOs, then the near death, and the Kundalini. I mean, it's like a Hollywood script. You know, it's uh, obviously, a, I'm going to use a word uh, or term, evolving process. That, that goes without saying, you know, am I evolving in the right way or am I de- de-evolving? <laughs> you know, it's that for, for everybody else to decide, but I'm kind of having fun, you know, along the way. And it's, it's, a, it's a hobby in the time. And, you know, it's that... If anyone looks at these three books and the three extraordinary experiences, I mean, let's face it, from a statistical standpoint, you know, you're a scientist, you know, the odds of you having an extended UFO experience, five to seven minutes, that's pretty long. And to share that with your wife and to have it that vivid, pretty rare. Not a lot of people do that. Then also to have this rather profound shared death experience, again, kind of rare. Then to have the Kundalini experience and the way that you describe it, you know, everyone else is in the room. No one else has the Kundalini experience. Bob does, you know, and Bob's writing books and Bob is a scientist with super well-respected credentials. I mean, why is the universe knocking at Bob's door? Yeah, I I can't help but ask that. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, because I asked for it. Is my is my gut feeling? I asked for it. I had this this strong intention, and maybe it's all about intention. A uh, long, long time ago, it was since I was a child. Along these lines, knowing that there's something far greater, far important, far more to what we regard as true reality, I was always asking for it. Always asked, interested in UFOs, consciousness, the brain, obviously. Uh, what, what was that? What were some of your first experiences? Because. Obviously, you went down a very uh, different path. You must have been a super smart guy to be as successful as you were academically. So then that probably drove you away from some of that stuff. What were some of those early experiences and what did you do with them? Oh, I I didn't have uh, early experiences. My first one was UFO experience. That was back in only 2012. Uh-huh. You know, it was almost like getting ready for retirement. Let's get this guy going. You know, I I do this to my wife. I I, I act as if there's uh, puppet strings over my head. Uh, not unique, right? But, so no, nothing before that, because invariably no. when I talk to people and they think back and they think long and hard and they go, 
well, you know, my grandmother was, <laughs> my grandmother was a psychic, you know, and she's, a, but none of that stuff at all, just kind of very vanilla nothing stuff. That, right, nothing that really uh, piqued my interest uh, or memory. But uh, if you ask a room full of people, have you ever had X, Y, Z kind of experiences, you're going to see hands go up. This is not that uncommon. Maybe that, maybe that these things are occurring within a, a relatively short time period it makes for it to be unique. But I can't help but feel that something's going on here. Something's at play. It could be me. Maybe I'm creating it. It's like uh, some people say UFOs are a form of psychokinesis. It's a mind generating it uh, through some process we don't need to uh, to address. But, but uh, it may, may be an aspect of PK here. But I I may be creating this because I want it so much. It manifests in, in varying ways. Who knows? Or there is simply another form of energy that will one day be part of Einstein's unified field theory, along with electromagnetism, gravitational, and two nuclear forces. Maybe that's a, a slow, tiny emissions from the body. Maybe it's torsion waves that some people claim, biologically generated in DNA. We can go down that path. It could be completely right or completely wrong. It may account for invisible pathways in terms of communication with people who have shared ESP. And there's clear telesomatic events between twins and Faraday cages. That results in remarkable exchange of energy and outcomes in these two individuals that, that certainly defy current laws of science. We see manifestations of this galore. What is mediating that process? And whatever that process, mediating that process is, I think we can get some insight into terms of what may be mediating many of the things that we're talking about in terms of one's perceptions of another reality uh, along the lines of the peak experiences that we're talking about because individuals have peak experiences claim to be able to have telepathy. People claim that they can communicate with beings from a, a, a ship, uh, you know, telepathically. We hear that all the time. Now, is that, again, I'm not going to say, you know, wishful thinking. I don't want to go there either. I don't give that much thought, uh, I, I should say, as a as rationale for this. I, I, if I leaned in one direction, it would be in a non-materialistic sense. We need that. We need materialism, but it's overemphasized. We need realism, the subjective experience, and to take people who have these experiences much more seriously because it may hold a key to what actually is, maybe not maybe what true reality is, but an alternate reality, uh, and it's more internal reality. That is real because it changes us. It's an experience beyond comprehension, expression, and it changes me from that day forward. Why can't that be reality? That sure as heck is more than, than my reality watching TV, you know, you know, 10 hours a day, and it may not be a completely positive one either. So the point is that there's an aspect of human performance potential of functioning that exists in so many manifestations. Let's give up the controversy. It, all of this is real because it's in here. It's real. Yeah, a certain percentage of people are indeed psychotic. Let's weed them out as best as possible. Uh, who claim to have these kinds of experiences, but but we know well-balanced individuals are having these remarkable events from gray sitting on their bed to seeing uh, their great-great-grandmother to et cetera, et cetera. And, and we have to understand that maybe that can indeed be a brain event, possibly governed by quantum processes, which we have yet to address, and may very well provide us with some understanding about how the brain itself operates, but it interacts with the brain and the central nervous system, the brain matter and the central nervous system. And the question is, is there a potential for that kind of activity to give rise to the perception of another reality? It goes back to the mind-brain filter. If you get rid of the brain's influence, impede its influence, then you're going to be exposed to an advanced state of awareness, advanced consciousness. What William James, the founder of, of uh, psych psychology, made that claim over 100 years ago. And, and the things that we're seeing now, at least in my mind, is, you know, some of it ascribes to what he was saying. Not that he's right, but I see I see a parallel. Meditators, when people meditate, when people have an NDE, their brain is understandably quieted and they have these kinds of experiences. Not always, not always. Psychoactivations. It, the point is trigger events often result when the brain is in a default mode network. It's, it's kind of self-referential.
mental activity. And, and that may lead to this ego dissolution, this extraordinary profound joy of feeling fluid, not solid, uh, at one with the universe, so to speak, the interconnectedness thing. Maybe that's, maybe that's uh, like the core self, the default mode network. Uh, but that is another reality. And it's another aspect of brain. And the brain may be more remarkable than we think. Maybe it's capable of removing consciousness from itself or an aspect of awareness and, and interacting. Maybe it has that potential. I don't know, but people claim it. Doesn't mean they're right. But maybe the yogis are some of other people we should be studying. And I get the sense we need to be studying them. Those that claim to have dual awareness or are able to voluntarily achieve that state. See, many of us go into that without preparation. Nobody gives us a scorecard. A, a, you know, prerequisite conditions. You know, this is what you're going to experience. It's hold on to your hat, man. You're right. going to see a UFO, a gray's going to be over here. You know, you're going to have a near death. You're going to see. No, we don't get, you know, that. you got to go on, on a slow scale, a slow trend, a slowly evolving process. And not my socks off because no one told me the day before that I was going to have a Kundalini. Uh, so it, it got to be done the right way. But the point is, so we're suffering the consequences, I think. We're born at the wrong time in service, I think, of seeing where, where, where potential can be in terms of human performance, consciousness, exerting a positive effect of mind on body, an, another area that's gotten certainly attention, the effects of meditation on the body. We know all the good stuff, of course. Uh, but up here again, uh, placebo effect, uh, no placebo effect is telling us a great deal about the mind's power, intentionality. Uh, again, we do not address this sufficiently, especially from childhood on in an appropriate manner so in order to derive the maximum benefit in a positive way, potentially, from intention, from meditating, from from all the stuff that these, these people who claim to be able to leave their body, and, and they're so-called well-balanced, you know, they're not psychotic, we, we test for that uh, what are they talking about right what they, go with go with the flow just you know just go past the entities interact with whatever you know it's like a, it's like a walk in the park kind of thing <laughs> it's not new to them so so they know how to manage it they've been there before man if i if it was me in their shoes you know I, i'd be close to a psychotic break and many, <laughs> of the, many of these individuals are many of them no i'm serious i know i know for a fact That, that's one of the things I think is interesting is when you talk to some of those folks or, you know, you listen to the Dalai Lama and they go, oh, yeah, well, we have a whole school of thought devoted to, you know, what to do when you have those kind of experiences, kind of a different kind of psychology. And I agree with you. That's where we're heading. And we have something to bring to that. The West has something to bring to that. So tell me this. Dr. Bob Davis, as we wrap things up here, you know, the natural follow-up question to the last one is, so what's book four look like? What's coming down the pike for you? Or maybe just what are you working on now? And tell folks about your website. Are you doing new stuff there? How can folks connect? Uh, no, my website is, I, I just don't give it enough attention as I should. Uh, uh, it's bobdavisspeaks.com. That's one word, dot com. Um, and information on the books, me, et cetera, it's, it's provided there. You know, sufficient enough to, I think, and contact me with any questions, of course. But but what's next? You know, I, I wrestle with that every day. You know, what is reality? You know, and, and what what the heck am I going to do tomorrow in terms of, <laughs> in terms of writing? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm wondering if I should get off this altogether because it's my enjoyment, my stimulation is in this direction in, in all its varying ways, uh, as you can see from the few books I wrote. But at the same time, it creates a great deal of frustration. During, during this task, I was part of Free. Uh, I'm no longer associated with Free, by the way, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences for a variety of reasons, but, but it allowed me to have an article published with Ray Hernandez, Dr. Rudy Shield, and Dr. Russell Chapone, the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Last year, I believe it was volume three, number three. You, people can access that online. I'm very proud of that paper. It doesn't, it doesn't mean people are actually interacting with, you know, the, these grays, et cetera, from a, from a ship. It is profoundly important to, however, and taken in context for the article that it is. I'm sorry for getting off on that topic, but that's... No, I'm glad, that's I'm glad you mentioned it because I was just looking at it the other day and people need to understand, I always emphasize on this show, how hard it is to get published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration and that I've had several people come on and say, you know, I've published a number of places. That was the hardest. That was the most rigorous review because they're on their game. They know that kind of stuff that you're talking about and they know how to scrutinize it. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, however, you know, Alex, it's not given enough attention. And I'm not saying this, this from an egotistical perspective, not given enough attention by ufology. I mean, you know, everybody focuses on a tip and everything else, uh, you know, so along those lines. And, and that's all well and good. It's important at some level. It, it generates business for you know who, it's, uh, all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't get at us anywhere. And I think this is simply the way to go. Nice. You know, Bob, I think you, you hinted at a follow-up discussion. We will definitely have to have one down the road because there's a lot of stuff going on with you that we definitely want to talk more about. And I love the fact that you have the ability and the desire to dig into some of this research and people will find that in the book too. So it's backed up and they can understand it and verify it themselves, which is the only way to ever understand that. So thanks again so much for joining me and we finally get to connect. It was awesome. Oh, it's really a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, I, you have an excellent show and I've uh, always listened to it. So I know you keep doing it. We, we need more people like you to help educate more people on this, these important matters. And thank you. So thanks for watching this video. And if it wasn't really a video, but just an audio stored as a video, I apologize. But there's more videos out there as well. But please check out the Skeptico website. You can see it here. We cover a lot of different stuff you might be interested in relating to controversial science and spirituality. A lot of shows up there, over 350 of them or so, all free, all available for download. So do check it out. <laughs>